everyone, I just wanted to take a quick moment to give you some information with regards to the, what we call the scheme of microbiology. So the first thing that you'll see is we have what are called the prokaryotes. So we have the bacteria and the archaea. So there's a couple fundamental differences. I'm going to point out only two today because we have to build our story of bacteria next week in Chapter 4. So for the archaea, they are found only in extreme environments, whereas our bacteria are found everywhere. The second thing that is different between them is that archaea do not have peptidoglycan. Now, we're going to go over that in a lot of detail next week in Chapter 4, so don't worry. Bacteria do have peptidoglycan, and it's how they're classified. So it is one of the most fundamental things that we're going to talk about. So that is going to be a topic that we are going to go into more detail with next week, okay? But our prokaryotes are our bacteria and the archaea. The next group in our scheme of metabolism are the eukaryotes. Now, I know many of you are probably familiar with eukaryotes, especially if you just came from A and P. So the examples of the eukaryotes that we're going to talk about in microbiology include fungi, algae, protozoa, helminths, and arthropods. So I'm sure that everybody has heard of fungi, which can be microscopic or macroscopic. Algae, which is the same, can be microscopic or macroscopic. It's also a photosynthesizer. Protozoa and helminths, you'll see that I have a little tag over here. The two of those together are part of what we refer to as parasitology because they are classified as parasites. They do harm to a human host. So we don't have good relationships with them within our bodies. So protozoa are microscopic, generally around water. We'll spend more detail with them later on. And helminths, again, are the parasitic worms. So the two of those together create the field of parasitology, which is a subunit off of microbiology. And then the last one are the arthropods. Arthropods are blood-sucking insects that I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Things like ticks, lice, mites, all of those good things that bite you. The last group in the scheme of microbiology are what we refer to as the non-livings. So your non-living group is going to need a host. All right, so we break them into three areas, and we are definitely going to add a lot more to these areas as we continue on, but I just wanted to give you a quick introduction this week. So our non-livings are viruses. They are everywhere. You can find viruses in water, in, wa in soil, all over the place. There's even been viruses that have obviously been airborne. Viroids are not in your book at this point. That's V-I-R-O-I-D, viroid. They are pieces of RNA, and they infect plants. Okay? They are in your book in Chapter 6 but I just wanted to make you aware of them. The last non-living that we're going to talk about are called the prions, P-R-I-O-N, prions. They are infectious proteins. They are all fatal because they turn the brain to what looks like Swiss cheese. So the brain will be lacking areas. It basically eats away at those areas of the brain. The individual loses function. Um, one of the best examples out there is called mad cow. Again, that's one of several examples of prions out there. So for your non-living, they have to have a host because the definition of life is the ability to be able to go through metabolism. These non-livings lack the ability to go through metabolism. Therefore, they are not classified as prokaryotes or eukaryotes. They have to be classified separately over here in the non-living category. So I hope that that sort of opens up what you were thinking, simplifies it, and makes it a little bit more tangible. I will be putting weekly um, updates like this on the board, and I hope that they are beneficial and you enjoy. Bye!